Lord be with you. So today is Wednesday. It's kind of a slow day, but we can still be excited. Matt Mulder came into our office this morning and said, happy hump day. So happy hump day, y'all. <laughs> I got two announcements for women. Sorry, men. One is that we are going bowling on Friday night at BAM <laughs> down on 16th Street. Um, so if you want to come bowling with us, sign up at grow.hope.edu. If you want to make a team, teams of about four or five. Um, if you don't have a team, sign up anyway. We'll put you with the team. Um, if you're going by yourself, meet us there at 7. If not, meet us at the Keppel House at 6.45. Don't be late. We've got a reserved time, so we want to make it count. Second thing, women, is that we are starting recruiting for small group leaders for next year. How many of you are leading a small group or in a small group right now? Yeah! So if that's something that you would like to be a part of in, in a leadership role next year, um, I, would, I would encourage you to seriously consider filling out the application. It must be submitted by next Friday, April 11. Um, and then I'll meet with you and we'll talk about what that means to, to lead a small group. So, announcements out of the way. And now, Paige Douglas. Paige is a first year student at Western Seminary. Many of you have seen her in chapel or at some of the women's events. She is interning in our office. And she has come this morning to bring the word of the Lord. So would you pray with me before Paige speaks? Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We ask that through Paige, your word would illuminate our lives, would give us a clear path to follow. In Christ's name, amen. Hi guys. Before I get started, I wanted to give you three short things about myself. I'm a Hope graduate, last May. Oh yeah. See, Matt has nothing on me. Hope, Calvin, I mean really. <laughs> Second, I grew up here in Holland. What up, Hollandites? Woo! And third, and this one I know I'm going to get a big resounding cheer from, I am a G Camp Geneva girl. Yeah! I worked there for three summers. My first two, I got to work with the High Ropes course. And with the High Ropes, we have a climbing wall. Now, when you work climbing walls, you learn a lot about climbing, way more than you expect. What I still know is that I am a pro belayer that I am a semi-decent climber, and that I remember a fair share about the equipment. One of the most important pieces of equipment with climbing is the rope. We wouldn't really think that, right? Because it's not like you're strapped into it and it's not gonna save you if you fall from a cliff. I mean, really. But they are really important. And there are two main types of rope when climbing. There's the static rope and there's the dynamic rope. Static rope, is made to be very secure. There's no stretch to it. It's made to hold a consistent weight. Dynamic rope is made with quite a bit of bounce. It stretches when it takes on a sudden load. I also learned that these two different types of rope have two very different uses. I learned during my first two summers out at Geneva that you need to be aware of these different types of uses because uh, each situation brings its different challenges and each rope faces those challenges in a different way. Static rope is better suited, suited to repelling and holding a weight for a long period of time. It won't stretch and bounce the way that din dynamic rope does. And dynamic rope is better for climbing because of its stretch. It's good for catching you. Each rope is created differently with specific tasks in mind. My job at Geneva was to determine which rope was best used for each situation. Now, in our lives as Christians, we are called to make difficult decisions all the time. Some are complicated and involve countless options. Others, like my situation with the climbing rope, have two clear-cut options. The difficulty lies in judging the surrounding circumstances so that we can see which of your options which of the two options work the best. 
Paul gives us an example of this kind of one or the other situation in Romans 14, 13 through 23. Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing unclean, nothing is unclean in itself, but is unclean if anyone who thinks it is unclean. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for you to make others fall by what you eat. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. The faith that you have, have as your own conviction before God. Blessed are those who have no reason to condemn themselves because of what they approve. But those who have doubts are condemned if they eat because they do not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Trigg talked on Sunday about how to avoid being an ugly Christian. That person who chooses to ignore the discomfort of the people around them and judges others for their different faith practices. We don't ever want to be that judgmental person, but sometimes we find ourselves putting on that role anyways. In Romans 14, Paul is telling us about the importance of not causing others to stumble. Like Trigg talked about, we need to recognize what makes those around us uncomfortable and respect that. But I don't think Paul intends us to walk around accommodating every person's discomfort. Verses 22 and 23 say, the faith that you have, have as your own conviction before God. Blessed are those who have no reason to condemn themselves because of what they approve. But those who have doubts are condemned if they eat because they do not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We too have convictions within our faith. Practices that should be respected by the people that are around us. Now I'm not saying walk around expecting everybody to bow to your desires and opinions. That's just returning to the idea of the ugly Christian. Instead, I think Paul is saying not to just give up on your convictions when working to respect others. There is tension in Paul's words in Romans 14. This tension is between the need to hold our beliefs and respecting the faith styles of those around us. Paul uses the example of the dietary laws that the Jews and the Gentiles held. Jews followed kosher laws and Gentiles did not. Paul brings the tension to a point in verses 22 and 23, saying that while you should respect the practices of other Christians, you should not feel required to permanently change your practices to match theirs, because doing so would be moving from acting out of faith to acting in sin. We need to hold to our beliefs so that we can truly proclaim what we believe. If we are changing the way we live our faith each time we encounter a new way to practice faith, then we will never know what it means for us to be a Christian. We need to enter each situation with an open mind to decide if it is a good time to hold to our own practices or if it is a place where you should respect other people's practices instead. Respecting the faith styles of our friends, classmates, and cluster mates is vital for living in Christian community, but so is respecting your own practices of faith. The tricky part is determining what it is we are called to respect within our friends' practices, and when it is best for us to hold true to our own styles. We need to step back and examine the situation. Like with choosing a rope when climbing, we need to be aware of what will impact, what impact our decisions will have. 
It is vital to a growing Christian to understand that we must not only hold to our own styles of faith, but to also respect those of our friends and neighbors. We don't want to be that ugly Christian who has no patience or love for the faith life of those around us, but we also don't want to lose our own faith along the way. Verses 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not food or drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We need to actively work to reach this righteousness, peace, and joy. By walking through the life, through life constantly seeking the best outcome in each situation. We need to get to know our faith practices and those practices that surround us so that we can learn to respect them all. To choose, respectfully, how to best balance them together. Now, I wish I could just give you a formula for how to determine what to do in each situation, but it's not possible. But do think about this the next time you sit down for dinner at Phelps and some of your friends pray before they eat and others don't. Do you pray or not and why? Or when you're sitting in the pine grove having a conversation about whether your class, whatever your classmate said or did that day, do you join in the gossip? Do you just sit and listen or do you change the topic? How do you respond to the people around you is vital for your growth. Almost every situation that you encounter will have a moment where you need to decide, do I go with their practices or do I stick with mine? So go out and don't shy away from learning to experience new practices and don't give yours over too quickly. Remember to keep Paul's words in the tension he writes them in and go in peace.